What is the role of the patient in deciding on iron chelation therapy? There are two oral chelating agents, uh, a third one that's approved in a different setting, deferoprone. And then there's, there's um, a desferal or dif desferoxamine that's, that's a, you know, the subcutaneous. What's the role of the patient in deciding deferosyrox or, or, or deferoprone or, or desferal? How, how does that, is that a discussion that you have with the patients? Um, I do have discussion with the patients. I do describe to them the possibilities that are available. And uh, I mean, 99% of them want to depend on my judgment right. and my experience and observations with other patients. And I'll give them the benefit of my experience and tell them that I think this would, an oral agent is the best way to go. Amongst the oral agents, one of them can reduce the blood count. So we don't want to take that risk right. that we have really two choices left out of those two oral choices. The one that is more palatable and easier to tolerate is the newest one. And so we have these discussions about uh, uh, various possibilities. I like that you have a discussion about that to yes. educate them as to why they're going through it. And I think you're lucky if 99% of your patients agree with you and defer to you because that's a higher percentage than my practice. <laughs> um, but it, it makes sense to me also. We had a lot of experience with deferocyrex with the X-Trade um, uh, the, the X -trade formulation and found that we had to make a lot of dose adjustments or start at lower dose or sometimes chelate less than optimally just to get people to tolerate it from the gastrointestinal toxicity, still monitoring for nephrotoxicity or, or, or retinal, you know, retinal toxicities. Uh, but the newer formulation, I, I think, is a, sort of a remarkable thing that they're willing to take the same drug, change the formulation just to make it more tolerable is, is a, uh, an important advance and, and at least we'll deal with some of the side effects for people with GI toxicity. And I, um, I'm thinking about your patient, the, uh, the endocrinologist, um, who you ended up having him on both subcutaneous and oral chelation and we've been in that, rarely we've been in that situation as well where we really needed to address iron overload and had to be more aggressive to do it. Uh, for tolerance one or the other. It's an unusual situation, but that definitely happens. You know, another yeah. thing, James, I have suggested is that we should have testimonials from real patients who have been on iron chelation therapy for whom it has made a big difference that they are getting transfusion. I have a patient literally who is, I've been treating for 20 years. Last 11 years, James, she has been transfusion dependent at least three, sometimes six units a month. That's a heavily transfusion dependent patient for 11 years. You know, she's just in the jungle of Amazons. She is traveling all over, gallivanting the globe, going out to dinners. Why? Because she's so aggressive in her iron chelation. Ferritin level is never over 800. If it goes to 801, I get four calls from her saying, am I going to die? Because my ferritin is going up, but she's able to take the transfusion safely because she's so vigilant. And that, a testimonial from a patient like that would be so encouraging to those patients who are having second thoughts about it and, ah, I don't want to do it, no. Well, there is nihilism in our field that if we can't prove in a randomized study that some impact, you know, some intervention made a difference in survival or a hard endpoint, then people don't really want to do it if it has any expense or any toxicity. But I, I agree with you. That's a really important, um, a really important point. If you're... In a practice that doesn't have a lot of MDS patients, you may not see somebody who you start in chelation and they improve their cytopenias. And that's a real thing where you start chelation, you can see improvement of underlying hematopoiesis. I don't think the mechanism is completely worked out, but it must be involved with some of the things you were mentioning. But you won't pick that up in a, in a practice where you don't have a large enough group of MDS yes. patients, and therefore it feels anecdotal. So I hope that we'll be able to to package those experiences in a way where people can see the impact. Excellent point. Of the intervention. Excellent point. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I, I wanted to, to discuss what success looks like when you're dealing with this with chelation. What, what are you monitoring or what do you say was a success for the patient or, or when um, we don't take holidays uh, from chelation like you do, um, although I, that makes sense as a practice, but how do you decide to do that? I think when you see the ferritin level is now below 500, then most of it is really from the disturbed iron metabolism due to ineffective hematopoiesis, especially if you have the baseline before transfusions, ferritin level, and you see that you've reduced it down to that level again, 
then I really think it's important to give the break to the patient. So success to me is measured by a steady reduction of the ferritin level down to below 500. Secondly, improvement of cardiac and liver function, if that was affected to begin with. Third, improvement in cytopenias when they are getting no disease-modifying drugs could be attributed to nothing else but aggressive chelation therapy. So all those are indications of success of the therapy. No, we would follow a very similar practice. If we can get the ferritin down to less than 500, we'd be happy. And, you know, in hemochromatosis, for instance, we're trying to target a ferritin of 50 or 35, yes, and that's exactly. a, different, a different setting. That may not be realistic here. Not to say we shouldn't try that, I just don't have that experience. No, it isn't realistic because most of the high ferritin is from ineffective hematopoiesis. Right. It is not a true iron overload. Well, that's a good point. It's, yes. a, com it's a more complicated pathophysiology, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. And so how do you monitor prospectively for side effects or for toxicities in somebody who you're chelating? So you're monitoring their ferritin every, I don't know how often you do that actually. We do it once a month. Monthly, okay. So that's a little more frequent than other practices. So you're very you're dogged about it, and and how do you monitor for toxicities? Are you checking renal function from time to time, or and do you you have your patients see an ophthalmologist from time to time? All of the above. Yeah. Yes. Well, that that makes sense, and I think that'll be an important point with the newer formulations, because ironically, adherence will improve, and therefore we'll have to be as aware or more aware of toxicity as patients are able to stay on the medications who couldn't tolerate from before from GI side effects. 